Welcome to This Organized Life. If you're a mom, wife, or coffee lover seeking advice on how to reduce clutter and reclaim time, look no further than your host, Lori Palau, founder of Simply Be Organized and author of Hot Mess, A Practical Guide to Getting Organized. For a lot of people, clutter is their dirty little secret, but it doesn't have to be. Each week, we will share practical tips, chat with experts, and provide strategies on how to keep you organized. I hope that by sharing our stories, you feel a little less alone and more empowered to tackle the areas that are holding you back. So let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of This Organized Life Podcast. I'm your host, Lori Palau. If this is your first time joining us, you are in for a treat because today, or if you're a long time listener, you're still in for a treat. So joining me today is an Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker. And um, I was introduced to Kate, I don't know, a couple of months ago through uh, one of my SBO partners who said, you have to screen this documentary called, Do I Need This? And it was written and produced, directed the whole thing by Kate Skirmerhorn. I have to look to make sure, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. And Kate went down this whole journey, which she's going to talk about, of documenting her own family's um, journey through decluttering and excess and kind of the navigation of accumulating things and consumerism and why we hold on to the things that we do. And it was just a fascinating inside look into somebody's personal story. And I immediately reached out to Kate and said, this is a great, great piece and so important. I would love to have you on our show to share all the things about it with our listeners and our viewers. It's about to, if you're listening to this in real time or watching us in real time, um, Kate's about to have a screening. She's based up in Massachusetts and there's a film festival in Woods Hole, which by the way, I've been to Woods Hole. It's the cutest little town um, on August 6th. And they're going to be doing a, a screening there. So for anybody that's listening, that's local to that area, I encourage you go check it out. Um, and if you're not local, Kate's going to talk about how you can find it. And for all of our professional organizers out there, I know local NAPO chapters are going to be doing private screenings of her documentary as well. So again, we're going to have all those things and Kate's going to talk about it. So um, anyway, without further ado, I want to welcome my guest, Kate Skirmerhorn again. Hopefully, I didn't butcher that too much to the show. Welcome, Kate. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so glad. And so, hopefully, I did a an okay job, just kind of giving very top line overview about yeah. your work. And I know that this is not your first documentary, but it's um, something that obviously the topic specifically struck a chord with me in the work that we do here. And so um, in your own words, just tell our listeners a little bit about you. <laughs> well, well, um, I'm actually based in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm from the East Coast originally. <laughs> oh, I my apologies. I thought you were in road. I thought that you were up in that New England Cape area. No, I didn't realize I'm from New York originally, but um, oh. and there is a piece of the film shot on on uh, Martha's Vineyard, but um, and I spent summers there as a child, but but uh, no, I'm I'm actually yeah in San Francisco. Got it. So I stand <laughs> I stand corrected there. So, <laughs> um, and uh, I I uh, I'm mother of two, um, and I have been I started life as a photographer, a still photographer, and I moved into film about 20 years ago when I moved from London to um, San Francisco and um, started started making films at that time. But before that, I was a documentary filmmaker. I'm sorry, a documentary and sort of fine art photographer. I had um, worked on a long term photo project, um, a book called America's Idea of a Good Time. And that was sort of my first um, entry into um, American consumption, I guess, like the way we consume our pursuit of happiness. So, which includes demolition derbies and monster truck rallies and things like that. So I was driving around the country with my then very small son <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, photographing, you know, fairs and 
um, parades and things like that. So that was like sort of the seed, I think, for this this film um, was, you know, how we consume fun. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's very it was very fascinating. And I, of course, had a million questions going into it. Like, how did you pick this topic? You had your family. Were, were they on board? Like, there's so many different things like you could have easily documented somebody else's family and really been very removed behind the scenes, but that's not the approach you took. Maybe just tell our listeners, give them an over, you know, give them a little bit more detail than what I provided uh, about the documentary and kind of what prompted you to really turn yeah. this concept into a, an actual like feature project. Um, so Sorry that I have a dog um, jumping. I don't even. Computer. I don't even hear cheese. Okay, you guys, <laughs> really quick, in case we hear this dog, she has got the cutest. It's a Bernese doodle or burn. It's like a mix of a Bernese mountain dog and a dude and a poodle. And tell tell everyone her name. <laughs> her name is Moira Rose. Hello, Moira Rose, Chitch <laughs> Creek fans. <laughs> and her, her big brother her big brother is a mexican street dog rescue and his name is el chapo oh um, my gosh hysterical i love her she's like i'm sorry i have a dog i'm like we love dogs here it's fine <laughs> so it, so no need to no more apologizing for moira rose <laughs> yes. she's a puppy and very cute <laughs> and she's welcome to join the conversation so okay. anyway mm -hmm. as you were saying about the show about your uh about your project yeah so so the film um <clears throat> do i need this it uh the tagline is it's about consumerism excess and the stuff from which happiness is made um it started out as a well i should back up and say it started um this, this I, the second sort of seed of an idea that came from a photo project was a project I was a photo project I was working on called useless objects. So mm. I would buy things from the Sky Mall catalog when it existed. Um, I totally remember the Sky Mall catalog. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I would buy, um, you know, hot dog cookers and um, drivable coolers and just things that I thought were completely ridiculous and I would buy them photograph myself using them and then return them with um with messages saying things like um you know um why would I buy this ridiculous hot dog cooker when I own a frying pan um and anyway that got me thinking about all of these things that I um would buy them and return them, but other people live with those things, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they're filling up their houses. So I started thinking really about the way other people consume. And I was not part of this project um, at all in the beginning. And I wanted to make a sort of sugar-coated environmental film to make people really think about their consumption habits. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of filmmakers have, have made really excellent projects about, um, you know, the, our impact on nature, but I wanted to focus on human nature and why, you know, why we buy things and, and how they're impacting us and, and thinking that the end result would be to sort of hopefully have viewers um, go away from the film feeling like they couldn't buy things without asking themselves, do I need this, you know, more conscious consumption. But as time went on, um, I mean, I started interviewing people. I interviewed a woman, you know, I have some of the characters in the film include um, a woman in Mill Valley, California, who um, she has, uh, she's a zero waste advocate and her, um, her she, every, each year, her family only consumes, um, only makes uh, one mason jar full it of It was waste. unbelievable. I, I mean, <laughs> I, my mind was blown. My mind was blown when I saw her. <laughs> I was like, what? I know, family of four, right? Yeah. Yeah. So her and I interviewed, um, well, uh, someone who um, didn't consider herself a hoarder. I don't know um, technically whether she is or not, but her house is just full. You know, you can't really walk across the room um, because of the stuff. And I was, um, I wanted to find somebody at the, sort of end of life cycle. So a, a child of, um, I was thinking of a child whose parents were, had maybe died or were at that late stage in life. I mean, an adult child mm -hmm. um, who um, 
you know, had to think about all of those things that were accumulated over a lifetime and what to do about them. But I couldn't find anybody. And then uh, in addition, I started thinking, well, why am I looking at all the other people? Like I actually, I don't have the problem of buying single use items and, um, you know, filling my house with them, but my house is full, as you can see. <laughs> and, um, and I have a lot of trouble getting rid of things. So I decided to, well, and then my, my parents um, were downsizing from a pretty big house into a small assisted living. And in addition, um, my mom um, was showing early signs of uh, dementia. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started pointing the camera at my family um, instead of looking for somebody else. And how did they put, what was, what was their initial kind of thoughts about that? Like, did you say, I want to make this documentary or I'm working on this project and I'm going to use you guys as the subject. Like, how did um, that come? I'm just curious. Cause I know my family doesn't want to have anything to do with this work that I do yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Well, <laughs> my mom, um, I was surprised that my mom was willing to let me turn the camera on the family because she's she doesn't necessarily like to be behind the camera um, or in front of the camera. My my dad is much more um, willing. And um, in fact, on my last film, which was about marriage, it's called After Happily Ever After. And it's about modern marriage. I interviewed people for that film um, that had been married 50 years and over. And I really wanted to interview my parents. And my dad was all ready to tell me the secret to a happy marriage, but my mom wouldn't be in the film. Wow. So they weren't included in that film um but uh my um but on this one yeah they were willing and um you know my kids didn't really have a say and my brother um my brother was um around and willing to be in it he's also a filmmaker actually and um he's and a storyteller he does moth storytelling and he um he uh, he's actually made a, a whole storytelling um, show called Birthday, where he looks at the same kind of events that I've looked at. And, um, you know, has we both kind of um, processed our parents um, late stages of life um, through creative means. Um, That's I, 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 I love that. Yeah. No. <laughs> so I'm wondering, were you surprised by like, did you have a, an idea in your mind of kind of what you thought you would be getting from your family? Like, were you surprised by the way that things unfolded um, and the way that they navigated through the whole kind of decluttering and downsizing process? Um, I mean, the whole way that the story unfolded was really surprising for me because, um, well, um, I guess because um, in large part because dementia became um, so uh, much part of the process. And so I guess it happened all so quickly. So everything kind of changed when my mom really got sick. And, um, and when she did get sick, um, <clears throat> you know, really started to decline um I became so attached to everything of hers I didn't want to let go of anything so um where she she got I mean I guess when you get to that stage of life and when you're you know getting into your 80s and and or late stages of life and um you know I think I noticed with my parents that they were being very pragmatic about everything they my dad would I had there was one scene that didn't make it into the film that I I really tried to get in where um my dad and I were going through family photos and I didn't want to I mean that to me was something was, I was not willing to give up and he you know he was just getting rid of things just throwing them and I kept saying please don't throw these photos in away and and he said well you know if you don't um if you don't throw this away I'm just gonna ship it all to you and then when you die your kids are gonna have to deal with it and that was so striking to me and because that's what he was thinking about he was thinking about I don't want to give you all this stuff when I do die um 
and and that I don't know that really stuck with me and it really when I think about the stuff in my house it's true you know I don't want to leave who wants to leave behind Mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff for our kids to um, deal with and right now we're living in a time where um, that we we're living with unprecedented amounts of possessions um, in our in our homes and so um, we all are going to be stuck with a lot of a lot of you know stuff that we um we're not going to know what to deal with and and we don't know you know like um something might have emotional value to you but is it going to have that kind of emotional value to your kids and do you even want it to (laughs) yeah i think you bring up a really good point and it's funny be not funny but it you know there's a couple things that you said that i kind of want to circle back around one of them being the whole you know or do we want to leave our kids with this legacy of stuff? Like what, or, or more importantly, like what is the legacy that we want to leave to our kids? And I had a client, this was going back a few years, probably right before the pandemic. And she was a woman that was in her late forties, early fifties with teenage kids. So we were sort of peers and kind of stages of life that we were at And she had metastatic breast cancer and was doing well, but knew that, I mean, all of our days are numbered, let's be honest. And I don't mean this to be a downer, but again, you know, we all know that we're not going to be here forever, but when you have some sort of a terminal diagnosis of something that you, it, it brings your mortality really into light, whether it's dementia, cancer, what have you. And so she had called me and asked me to come sit with her because she had had accumulated so many things that were, she was deeming as keepsakes over the years. Mm. And she said, whether I have 10 years or 10 months or whatever, I don't want to leave this. This is not what I want to leave my kids with. So I would want to do some of the heavy lifting now so that later on. And I think that is such a, incredible gift that anybody, regardless if you're in best of health, but sometimes it takes us getting to the late stages of our life or getting to that point where we're like, okay, now I don't want to have to do that. And I think that's a wonderful gift as parents. So when I work with people, I always try to set that, like, why are you holding on to it? Especially when it comes to kids, artwork or keepsakes and things like that. And I'm all about having some sentimental memorabilia. Don't get me wrong, people. I'm not saying you need to throw out everything, but being selective over what you're placing the value on, um, I think is so important. And again, I, the perspective. Yeah. Well, um, one thing, another thing I really wanted to include in the film, and there, there's so many layers of this film, it was hard to include everything I wanted, but um, but I, I wanted to look into the Swedish death clans, uh-huh. which, because that sort of addresses. Yeah. And I've heard of it, but I'm not an expert at all. I should probably, I'd like to do an episode. If anybody out there is an expert in the Swedish death cleanse, reach out to us. Cause I would, I would love to learn a little bit more. Yeah. Well that, 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 um, the idea is that you exactly, you start preparing, you know, I mean, not in a morbid way, but you start thinking exactly about these questions of, um, you know, what do I want to leave behind and, and, um, you know, what, what legacy, and that was what the film, I mean, the, the film did not start thinking about legacy, but it really ended thinking about legacy. Um, you know, as I went on, I mean, I worked on this film for over 10 years. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So then I don't feel bad when it takes me five years to write a book because (laughs) don't feel bad. I do long-term projects, but, (laughs) um, so, um, but over those 10 years, yeah, I really started thinking more about legacy, like not just what do we want in our houses, but what do we want in our lives? What, what legacy, um, you know, were my parents going to leave behind and, what do I want to leave behind for my kids? And, 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 and it really grew, you know, to thinking about, you know, what is, 
what's meaningful in life, not just mm -hmm. in our homes, but, um, you know, the stuff we know that, um, stuff will never bring us happiness in the way that experiences do, you know, and it's something to really keep in mind as you're worrying about whether you can get rid of something. It's like, it's never going to bring you the kind of happiness that an experience will bring you. Absolutely. But then, you know, I, you also said something interesting, which again, I know it's for a lot of people that are, currently going through it or they've been through it when you either lose a loved one or you are in the process of watching that person decline all of a sudden everything that surrounds them everything that you remind you of them all of a sudden becomes magnified and the the you're wanting to hold on to it and I'm not a psychologist I play one on tv but I'm not <laughs> one but I've been, I've worked with people and I've experienced loss, even with both of my parents is you just want to, you want to hold on to whatever that represents because it's a, it's, you feel like it's a piece of them, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the bowl that they used. It's the, this, that, you know, whatever it is that it just gives you that memory and it brings you back to that time when that person was healthier. You were in a happy season of your life with them. Um, but it winds up giving this false sense of importance mm -hmm. to the stuff when it's really not about the stuff. It's yeah. about the memory and the people that that stuff reminds us of. But when, yeah. when you're in it, it's easy to become clouded with that emotional clutter. Right. Like one of the people I interview in the film, uh, Randy Frost, who wrote a book um, about, uh, it's called Stuff, um, oh, wait, uh, The Compulsive Hoarding and the Meaning of Stuff. Um, he's the co-author of that book. But he um, he talks about, in the film, he talks about how we infuse objects with meaning, you know, like this cup is just a cup. But if I think about how my mother might have used this cup, then yeah, it's not a cup anymore. It's but to everybody else who looks at it, it's just a cup. We like personify these objects. Yeah, yeah. So that's when it gets really hard. And I mean, I I'm not gonna lie. My parents' things that I've have, you know, the the things from um the past. I um have I I have I'm not I didn't suddenly through making this film think I'm gonna get rid of everything as you can tell from my house. I things really um. You know, I, I look at things and, and I think about my parents or, um, you know, my children when they were little, but it's a question of how many of those things, because if you're, if your house is just completely full, it, it loses all meaning. It has to be those precious things that, um, you know, those precious, not necessarily few, but fewer <laughs> things, I guess. Um, yeah. And there's no magic number. And that's the thing, you know, people will say to me, you know, like how many of X should I have, whether it's how many shirts should I have in my closet? How many books should I have on my bookshelf? Like there's not an arbitrary number, you know, because obviously there's so many variables. Um, but I think, again, it's the importance is if we give everything value and importance, then it dilutes really yeah. the few that or the fewer, in your case, things <laughs> that yeah. that really have meaning and, and tell the story to other people yeah. and that you want to continue on. I want to ask you something because um, we talk in anybody that's listened to us for a while or, or knows kind of my framework, I look at clutter in three main camps. Now there's kind of subcategories from that, but big picture, we look at three different areas. We look at physical clutter, which is the stuff that you see. Um, we look at emotional clutter, which comes really more from guilt and fear. So it could be this cost a lot of money and I don't want to get rid of it. It could be sentimental. This reminds me of my mom or my kid or whatever, um, or it could be that scarcity mentality that like, I don't want to get rid of it because what if I need it? Right. So that's usually kind of that stronghold from emotional clutter. And then we talk about calendar clutter, which is that time management productivity piece, if you will, where not having enough margin in your life to do the things that you want to be doing. And so you're constantly, you know, your calendar is bursting the way your proverbial closet would be bursting, so mm -hmm. to speak. So usually when I'm talking to people, I'm usually looking at one of those three areas as being dominant, even though 
if we were to do a model of it, they would be concentric circles because they're all interrelated and they're not siloed. But usually when I talk to people, when I work with clients one-on-one, there's one of the three types that is more dominant for them. So I'm curious for you, do you find that there's been a theme in your life where you have one that's more dominant? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I would definitely say I'm not, I, I'm not, um, motivated by consuming new things. I'm, um, my issue, (laughs) the issue that I really had to tackle during this making of the film is, um, emotional clutter. So, um, I think, yeah, just, you know, that, that everything took on, um, meaning, um, from my parents and my children too. I mean, it's funny as your children get older and you imagine this, this younger child and you just want to hold on to that. Even when you love your older children equally or more, you still want to hold on to their little selves. And, and so there's actually a scene in the film where I'm working with um, a professional organizer, um, Kathleen Crombie, and she, um, we're looking at, um, you know, she just lays out all of um, these things from my my son, when my son was little, all of his little toys. And I just go, oh no, I need this one. And I need that one. And I need that. And it's, you know, when you watch it, when I watch it on film, I'm so, you know, mortified, <laughs> but I just sort of took this whole pile and said, I'll deal with this later. And, I just... and you know, I, I want to thank you for sharing that. And I want to kind of also stop you because I, there's a lot, one of the greatest like things that I, it's, it's like such a mission for myself with this business and this platform with our listeners and whether you're a private client or listener or reader, is there so much shame that I see people have shame and embarrassment that surrounds their stuff and that need to apologize (laughs) for, sorry, I have so much stuff. Sorry, I've got piles of paper. Sorry. You know, and I see it not just with you, like with people in general. And I, and I, I say this, you know, I say it in my book and I say it all the time, but I, it's worth reiterating. Like, I don't want cluttered or stuff to be people's dirty little secret. I don't want them to feel like this is something that I need to apologize for. You know, we, my goal is so that people can live meaningful lives and not allow your stuff to control you. Be wise. I feel like if you are intentional with the things that are in your house, that trickles down to all areas, relationally, financially, um, you know, spiritually, there's so many benefits of not putting that idolatry on the stuff, right? And that's really what my mission is. It's not about the pretty bins even though that's like a great byproduct, you know, pretty bins, baskets, classes, all that stuff. But that's not the motivation behind it. It's really about living the life that you want and realizing that it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. So I just want to say for not just you, but for anybody out there that's listening that is struggling because emotional clutter is a big stronghold, and especially when you're going through a life transition. And that life transition could be your kids growing up in into adulthood or their late teenage years. Cause how old are your kids? You have two. My daughter is 17 and my son is now 26. So, okay. Yeah. And (laughs) so again, your baby is getting ready to go into that next chapter. And I've got, you know, I have a almost 19 and a 21 year old. So I get it, you know, and I think for a lot of times, and then again, with the whole aging parents and you either watch, you're starting to watch your parents decline for people that are in similar seasons of life to us. And all of a sudden now they're not the person that they once were, or they're not here anymore. And so you want to try to hold on to that and, and being able to make those, those decisions using logic and not driven by emotion. And that's sometimes hard because like you said earlier, your dad was super pragmatic when he was going through this, looking at this and you were coming at it from an emotional standpoint. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I wanted to just go back to what you said at the beginning. If that is that, um, yeah, with the shame piece, yeah, for I, sure. um, I feel like I could look at all the people I interviewed with no judgment, but it was when I looked at my own house, that's when it, you know, 
it was it was really hard. But one of the things that I I did find making the film um sort of a reason why I noticed people keep things and why I keep things I I I just started thinking that one of a really important piece is that we're holding on to dreams. So mm. it's sort of dreams of a day like you know when I'll have the space to put the stuff that I have sitting in my garage or dreams of a day when I'll finish this project like it really started to feel like that was an important piece that I hadn't thought of um, before making the film that that um, motivates us to um, to hold on it really that is such a valid point and it's my very best friend in the whole wide world who's like a sister to me I was over helping her declutter some a guest room and going through some old and she's definitely somebody that's a way more sentimental and has a large family and so has tons of like hand-me-downs from family and whatnot and we came across some bedding that she doesn't use and it was in really good shape and she was like I'm saving this it was her son's who's now 25 and she's like I'm saving this one day we'll when I get a shore house and mm -hmm. like legit. And it was that piece, that dream. And I've seen that repeated over and over again, where it's again, that, that, um, that, you know, you have this image in your mind and that, that storytelling, it can be very strong in, yeah. in clouding the decision-making yeah. of what needs to stay and what should go. Yeah, I think when I started to think about that dream piece, I was actually able to to say, okay, you know, in my garage, I had some old furniture that I was keeping until the day I could get it reupholstered and, you know, put into my house. And I said, okay, either you get this chair that's been in here for 20 years, you know, and wherever I've lived and I've mm -hmm. lived in you know, a lot of places <laughs> so that I've been carting these things around, either you get it refinished and put into the house or it goes and I did I got it I got it fixed and now it's living in my house but that's <laughs> awesome and that's the thing is I tell people also your stuff should be giving you should be you should be honoring your stuff in the sense again not idolatizing your stuff but if it's shoved in a basement or an attic or a closet then it's just taking up space so if you're going to use it enjoy it um then 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 it's not clutter, then it's actually something that has some value, but you're not doing yourself or the item any favors by having it shoved in the corner of the garage. Yeah, exactly. We're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, um, we're going to just continue our conversation with Kate. So sit tight. So you started to just touch on this before with, you know, kind of when you we started saying, okay, I'm going to give myself a, almost like a deadline to do that as I started to recognize this kind of dream piece of it. What, what else did you learn throughout this process that maybe surprised you or maybe didn't surprise you, but things about yourself um, as well as from other people, but you know, that you, that you learned. Um, well, I'll start with other people. <laughs> Always easier to start with other people. Go for it. I um the I guess I'm thinking in particular about one of the characters that I met who made me realize this this need to have things is just totally universal. <laughs> um, was a monk, I a Buddhist monk, um, who I met, and um, you know, he lives in a a monastery, um, in the Oakland Hills in California, and you know, you, from the outside, you think this guy probably has one set of robes and, you know, will doesn't have any worldly possessions. Well, he took us into his room where he lives and showed, opened his closet. And wait, I don't want to give away, but okay. I can just say that he has the same problem the rest of us have that like, well, I might need this someday. And um, that was really... <laughs> talking to me that instinct um that was there even in somebody who's living this you know monastic life yeah and again and i think that's a that's reassuring in the sense that nobody's immune we all have our strongholds in different areas and even even a buddhist monk could get sucked into consumerism and that's another thing really quick that i want to 
don't know about really quick, but that I want to kind of circle back to is it really that consumerism piece and the environmental impact is also something that I think is really important because people declutter or people don't get rid of clutter for multiple reasons. And one of them, and we don't spend a ton of time here talking about that environmental impact. We've touched on it before, um, and but that is something that is very, very, com- that's a very compelling reason for a lot of people to say, I don't want this to end up in a landfill. Um, or, and so people will hold on to things or people don't think about the environmental impact. So they are buying off of the SkyMall catalog or every latest gadget they will buy, not thinking of the larger implication from the environmental perspective. Do you want to speak into that a little bit? Um, well, <clears throat> in terms of getting rid of things, it's true that, of course, you know, um, charity sh- or, you know, during the pandemic in particular, like a huge percentage of the stuff that we were giving to um, Goodwill or Salvation Army was just ending up in the landfill, you know, and um, I, and of, and of course what we buy, the way we consume um, impacts, you know, the environment in so many ways. And so I, this film is not preaching about that. Like there are a lot of films that, um, that talk about, um, go more in depth into the environmental impact, but my hope, I mean, what I, feel is that the you know if we just slow down our consumption you know we're going to create less waste we're going to create less impact less impact on the environment we just um like slowing down to begin with is going to solve what we consume to begin with is going to solve problems in our own lives and for the environment that's sort of what i what i hope the takeaway you know one of the takeaways from the film will be is that um you know, you're, you'll impact your life in a more positive way if you're slowing down what you bring into your house and you'll um, impact the environment in a positive way as well. Absolutely. Now, I'm curious because, again, this was you had with the during this project, you had your parents, like you said, your brother, your kids, yourself. Where were you, where were you able to see like through lines of the way that you guys were all navigating? the clutter similarly? And were there areas, especially I'm curious with your kids, um, did they have a different approach and kind of value to the stuff? Were they looking at things through similar lens of as yourself or were mm-hmm. they approaching it differently? Um, I think my son and I have a similar kind of emotional attachment to things but the rest of my family um you know my mother was just like you know calling me a whore you know calling me a hoarder and telling me to get rid of everything and complaining about everything I was keeping and my father was also he's all I mean honestly he you know I'm similar to him but he was calling me out for my behavior um but my kids are really different so my son wants to hold on to everything and my daughter her you know she's very unemotional and I'm so grateful for that. I feel like I've plagued my son with this, um, you know, attachment issue. Like I try, I, I try to, I mean, I, he doesn't even live at home anymore and his room is still, you know, full of his childhood stuff. Um, that <laughs> like, it is something that you pass along to your kids if you're not careful. So I'm grateful that my daughter somehow has gone to another, you know, non-emotional path with her stuff. But, um, I definitely like, I feel like I've sort of hindered, you know, plagued my son in a way. Like I want to try to change my own behavior to impact him, to not be attached to, to things in the same way. Cause I just know um, the negative impact it has when you over attach to your possessions. Yeah, absolutely. And again, going back to that chain piece, like I don't want you beating, and this goes for anybody. <laughs> like, I don't want people to beat themselves up. I mean, I definitely think through my non-scientific, non-licensed, but my observations of doing this for a decade and a half is it's a learned skill and a learned behavior to a certain extent, right? So if you see your family consuming a lot or not getting rid of things, that's definitely things that our kids will pick up. However, 
I also, and we talked for a hot second before we hit record um, about the Enneagram. And you said that you had just started, done a quick assessment. And I'm actually, you know, I'm actually, it was, my wheels have been turning ever since because one of the things that I love about the Enneagram is, in addition to the fact that it looks like, it looks at your motivation is that it really highlights the three centers within each of us, our thinking center, which has to do with our logical analysis piece of it, our feeling center, which is the emotional component, as well as our gut and the doing center. And every number or type on the Enneagram is dominant. Again, all th- just like all nine types, you know, we're integrated and just like all different types of clutter, we're integrated, but there's a dominant center for each one of us, for each particular type. And there's a least access center for each one of us. And you quickly said, I took a test and I think I'm an eight. And I was like, oh, fascinating. (laughs) But as we're talking, and again, you can't type other people and we're probably not going to be able to dissect this whole thing during the conversation, but eights, because I am an eight, eights, least access centers feeling. So feelings, especially when it comes to clutter, are not something that are on my radar. I am doing and thinking. So those are my top two centers, right? Everyone's got their top two. You're dominant than the one that supports it. And for me, I don't struggle with clutter. My problem is I need to be able to hold space for those, be patient and hold space for those who do. And I have a daughter that's very dominant with thinking. I mean, sorry, with feeling and talked very openly about that, had that, the, the emotional weight. So I'm curious, you know, I'd love for you to probe a little bit deeper because if emotional clutter is really a thing, and I'm not saying that I'm sure there are are eights out there that struggle with emotional clutter, but you will be the first that I know of because most of the eights in my world and the people that I've interviewed through all the studies, um, that doesn't seem to be the dominant center that stands out for them when it comes to clutter. It's more, I'm overscheduled calendar stuff and just doing, doing, doing versus really having that, that stronghold piece that you've expressed. So I'm just curious for huh, you. That's funny. Maybe I have to go and do it again. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, um, uh, well, I saw some of the questions on there were like, do you try to, um, <clears throat> um, avoid emotion. So th- maybe that's uh maybe that's a piece that um I don't want to deal with the emotion of this stuff. <laughs> it just is but I if I have to if I have to start dealing with it it I can't you know make it go away. <laughs> the emotion is so strong. <laughs> yeah. And and it's interesting and and eights the emotion that eights tend to, and I'm overgeneralizing people, so don't send me hate mail, but oh, but the, <laughs> the emotion, because eights are in that aggressive stance. And so the emotion, when we do have that, it is more anger, rage than sadness or uh-huh. sentiment. So I, and I told the story a couple of months ago in a different episode I was actually, it was, I was talking to my therapist a couple of years ago and she was like, how did that make you feel? We were talking about a situation. I was like, what do you mean how to make me feel? It didn't make me feel anything. And she's like, yes, it did. It made you feel rage. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess if you're figuring that, but usually when people say, how does that make you feel? You think sad or joyful. And I'm like, all this happy, you know, touchy feely (laughs) emotions are not my (laughs) go-to. And so for eights, it's usually a little bit more gut driven than heart driven. Interesting. Well, I'm not sure I need to, maybe I I need to redo. Well, well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk. So read the road back to you. That's a really good, they'll give you some ideas. So you could see that. Um, Okay. So again, with your family, you talked about some common threads. Were there any other common threads that you saw with just all of the different characters in the piece? Mm. I feel like there were just so many different styles of, um, of interaction with possessions. 
Um, so I'm not sure if there was a common thread. As well, you could talk as... about that. So yeah, maybe just elaborate on that. So what? Well, are I some mean, I do dreams? think that the the dream piece that I yes. talked about earlier is a common thread. Like I really started to think that that was something that we're all when we are holding on to things, it's the dream of of um, <clears throat> you know it, how it's going to serve us. Mm -hmm. um, that's there. Um, when I think about, um, of course, though, when I think about the, the woman, um, Bea Johnson, who lives with, um, you know, she has the, um, she's, that's the family that, um, with the zero waste. With the and, zero waste, it's like insane. I'm like, yeah. oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't think that anything in her house is, is being held on to, um, for a dream. That's the only person I would say is not dreaming of something else because everything in her house, she's, thought of very, you know, clearly, do I need this? Do I need this? I mean, even in her kitchen, she pulls open the drawer and it's like one spatula, one, you know, ladle. And I mean, I could never do that myself. I could but... never do it either. <laughs> I just, let's, let's be honest. I mean, that is a, I kudos to her, but that is a very extreme approach to minimalism. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think there's, it's not an either or. It's not either I'm bordering on hoarderism or I have to have one spoon. Like it's, there's such a spectrum in between. And I just want everyone to know that, you know, especially yeah. people that are going to be starting the process. Um, it, you, that doesn't necessarily have to be your, your goal just because that was hers. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. <laughs> So what surprised you or was there anything that surprised you that you weren't kind of, I don't know if you went into this with certain expectations or not, but was there anything that you were like, wow, I never thought of that. Or that was a really interesting, like, and sort of a takeaway that you found wisdom in that you didn't really kind of see going into this. Um, I mean, it was over the, the film, I made over a 10 year period. So um, I guess the whole process was things unfolding in, um, you know, little by little. <laughs> now I have two dogs. Um, oh my God, they're so cute. Anybody that's watching this on YouTube, oh my gosh, the dogs are adorable. So, and if you're not, head on over to our YouTube channel because they're <laughs> adorable. They're playing in the back. They're like, okay, mom, you've been talking for almost an hour. We have to go. <laughs> We're going to wrap up in a second, but I'll well, let you answer okay. this question. I'll let you answer this question. Um, so oh, surprising. Oh. Um, it's funny because I can't really, I don't think I can um, necessarily say that anything was surprising because the whole process of making a documentary film is like, um, you know, it's like a discovery. So it's not like you suddenly have a shock. It's like, oh, little by little, you're sort of peeling back the onion on this, this subject. Um, so, um, I mean, I was certainly shocked to see my own uh, reaction to getting rid of things like I did not realize that you know I had what you could call a problem with my um you know <laughs> attachment um and um I guess it was I mean yeah I, I don't think I have um a, a clear answer on the hey surprise. that's totally <laughs> fine no no worries at all and again there's no right or wrong and you, like you said this was a 10-year journey so again it it it's an evolution, you know, it was yeah. a whole work in progress. What's your goal with people as they see this? I mean, what do you want people to walk away feeling and doing? I mean, aside from being more mindful about what you're bringing in, is that, is that really just the end goal for you? Or is there with the, with the project, the takeaway, or is there something yeah. more? I mean, I think the end goal really is to have people consume more consciously and to, um, I mean, I think um, the say, yeah, just live more consciously. I think my projects are, are always focused um, a little bit on, you know, well, my last film about marriage was, you know, go into marriage really 
consciously don't just go in because that's you know a stop on the game of life <laughs> you know like yeah. actually spend time thinking about it so i think that really is my end goal with this film is to really think more consciously um about the way we consume and um i mean i you know and think about um you know what really makes us happy in life like what i think that is um where the film ended up was really looking at more at happiness than anything else you know i think that's where it lands is happiness legacy um what do we what do we want the bigger picture of our life to be and um you know it might start with thinking about um the little the things in our house but i, I hope that um the message is more is broader than that and more um examining you know the meaning you know finding meaning in life i love that i love that i think that's a perfect place for us to just tell everybody where can they find you where can they learn more um how can they screen the the your amazing project so all of the things so um the next screening is on um august 6th at the at the woods hole film festival in uh in massachusetts um and you can look at uh look at the woods hole film festival um website for uh tickets and um for any other information like about screenings for um you know private screenings and that um, you can reach me through my website, which is do I need this.org or my um, photo, my broader website is Kate uh, is my name, Kate skirmahorn.com. And we'll have links for everybody in case, again, you're new to the show. We'll have links to everything that we talked about in our show notes on our podcast page. So not to worry, you can just go there and click to connect up with Kate and learn more about all of this project and all the amazing work that she's doing. And that's Moira Rose saying, okay, we're going to take one more quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to just wrap things up by putting you in the hot seat. So sit tight. <laughs> all right, Kate. So I'm sitting here looking at you with this incredible wall bookshelf behind you. So this question might be really tough for you. Um, we always like to get inspired by our guests and clearly you've already done that. And we're curious about what book has been inspirational or transformational in your life. And I'm sure there's been more than one, but if there's something that you do that you go back to, or that you refer other people to, I would love to have a, a insight into what that book is. Mm. That's such a hard question, but, um, <laughs> I think I, I'm kind of, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I think the book that's had the most impact on my life <laughs> is probably um I can't is uh Pippi Longstocking from my childhood I love <laughs> because that. I wanted a life of it of adventure and um you know unexpected uh paths and um well I really wanted a, a horse and a monkey in my house but I think just living um I don't think you're an Enneagram eight expected. I don't know I know you're not supposed to type other people but that just I don't know I think we need to revisit that whole <laughs> okay I'm gonna go back and, and check that out <laughs> oh my gosh that's one of the greatest I mean I we've got all we've run the spectrum again there's no right or wrong answer with any of these um but that is just an awesome awesome book I love the fact that you said that that's amazing and then we're gonna wrap up with our last two questions which is in this particular season of your life where do you feel that you are the most organized and where do you feel like you're a little bit of maybe a hot mess? <laughs> I'm in a, I guess, um, a hot mess would be my office <laughs> and my paper clutter. Um, but funny enough, that's also where I think I feel the most organized. I feel the most organized when I'm juggling a thousand things at one time and I can just keep them all going. Once one ball drops to the ground, then, then that's where I don't feel organized yeah. at all. I feel chaotic. So as long as I have all the balls in the air, I with as particularly with work, I mean, plus being a mother and all that, um, <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, yeah, that's where I feel um, the most organized. But you know, when I walk into my office, um, I do wish 
that I was uh, more organized. I, I long for, um, I long to be one of those people that can just know where my paper is and not have to have a pile because I have to, you know, I think I, uh, I won't find it again if it's not on a pile on my desk. I wish I could be a little different. Well, that if way. that's something that you would like to work on, I know someone that could help you with that. I know several people and I actually even have an amazing, we have a, a part, a SBO partner community, which are professional organizers that we endorse all over the globe. And we actually have one in the Bay area. So just put that out there. If that's something at any point that you want to explore. Oh, and you have, but you have a professional organizer that you work with on your show. So, um, Oh, but that was on the East Coast, right? Because you filmed that on the East Coast, or was um, the professional? She she moved to Chicago. The oh, woman. okay. Well, I do you have need... somebody I work with out okay. here, but um, but uh, yeah, I wish I wish she could come every day. Yeah, <laughs> and just after I work, then she don't could go we in all? my office. <laughs> don't we fix all fix things up? That would be. Uh, well, Kate, thank you so much for coming on our show. Um, again, I appreciate you. I had the privilege of getting in advance. Uh, screening of her documentary. And it was so insightful, so vulnerable, so eye-opening. And um, I really encourage everybody out there um, to watch it, um, spark conversation, get you thinking about how, why you're buying stuff, holding on to things. And um, it was really awesome. So thank you so much. And if you're new to our show, please make sure you click the subscribe button, follow us on social media, this organized life podcast, connect up with us. Um, we have a ton of back catalog episodes. So if there's anything that you want to see, make sure to check that out. We're on every streaming podcast app as well as on YouTube. So until next week, I'm Lori Palau. Peace out. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, please spread the love and share it with your friends. If this is your first time joining us, make sure to click the subscribe button wherever you're listening so you never miss an episode. And while you're there, please leave us a review so other people know that our show is worth the listen. You can also find us on YouTube and Instagram at This Organized Life Podcast. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can head on over to our website at simply the letter B like boy organized.com, which is filled with tons of resources, including free downloads, checklists, links to our amazing organizing partners, and all of our digital offerings. I'll see you next week for another episode of This Organized Life.